they say water is the universal sovereign. I say it's gold. However, alcohol does help. That's a layman theory. All right, Mayor Kraft, members of the council, it is great to be here to discuss water. Um, I chose this slide template because I think it represents water very well. It shows the many complex organizational components of water, the complexity of it and kind of the unique timing for certain things to, to come to fruition in water. So I did, I did like this. The agenda for the presentation today, I'm going to discuss uh, water resource overview, so we're all on the same page. Uh, talk about Chino Valley's water resources and also the future challenges facing the town and its water needs and then considerations for future water planning. Again, just a brief overview. So Chino Valley, like Prescott and Prescott Valley, are within the Prescott Active Management Area, or AMA, where groundwater rights are quantified. Water rights are grandfathered um, and highly regulated, especially for new development. These water rights are highly regulated due to the fact groundwater is being pumped faster and is being naturally or artificially recharged into the aquifer, or the aquifer is not in a sustainable water usage condition. Within AMA's new development must obtain a 100-year assured water supply uh, to meet that uh, requirement by the state of Arizona, and I'll discuss the components of that shortly. There are only three exceptions to these existing water rights to obtain what's called new groundwater within the AMA. The first exception allows cities, towns, or private water companies to serve water to their existing customers, and these are referred to as service area rights. The second exception allows ADWR to issue new groundwater pumping permits under certain circumstances for things like mining operations, um, road construction, or uh, general industrial use. The third exception allows for what we refer to and everybody's familiar with are the exempt wells which the requirements are having a pump um, accessing groundwater at 35 gallons per minute or less for the use for domestic purposes, stock, or small commercial or industrial uses. And then lastly, outside the AMAs, the frontier, um, there's only a limited uh, regulatory um, device in effect for the adequate water supply program for those developments outside the AMAs. The program requires developers to submit a water adequacy or inadequacy report to Department of Water Resources. Um, outside the AMAs, there is no groundwater rights per se. It, it comes down to uh, the doctrine of reasonable use, uh, meaning that as long as a landowner withdraws groundwater to make reasonable and beneficial use of the landowner's property, neighboring landowners have no claim for damages even if the groundwater withdrawals adversely affect water levels under the neighbor's property. So keep that in mind if you're outside an AMA. The doctrine of reasonable use. So here are two images of the Prescott AMA. The map on the left shows Prescott Active Management Area. That's the boundary here. About, is it working? That's the boundary there, that's circular. Uh, it's 400. So this is the Prescott Active Management Area here, the red boundary. It's about 450 square miles. We can see the corporate limits of Chino Valley, Prescott, and Prescott Valley. Um, all three municipalities are within the AMA and must abide by the AMA strict regulatory compliance and codes. Um, there's a small northern piece of Chino Valley just north of the Prescott uh, Active Management Area, so that is exempt from the requirements of the AMA. The AMA map on the right illustrates the Prescott AMA is comprised of two sub-basins, if you weren't aware of that. Little Chino to the north, the upper Agua Fria to the south. Um, groundwater flow directions and the surface water flow directions are generally um, indicated by the red arrows. So just want to point out just the significance of this is um, 
Chino, Prescott are primarily Little Chino. Prescott Valley has a significant portion within the upper Agua Fria, but all three municipalities are pumping water from this little area right here. All of us are. That's, that's it from the opera standpoint. Yes, Celia. Um, so Prescott Valley is primarily o over the upper Agua. Agua, Agua Fria. Thank you. Because uh, Tarkowski always talks about that, as about how much water is there compared to uh, other areas in the region, but you just said something contrary to that. The Prescott but Valley has moved a lot of their production wells to the Little Chino. And there's a way to kind of like, you know, we've always referred to the basins as a big bowl right. of, of water. We all have straws in the water. Well, a bowl kind of has a perfect, you know, there's a certain volume that if you keep drawing water every year, it can kind of count on this. But geologically, you can see there's hard rock areas. This is a kind of a topographic relief. There's hard rock. There's some other uh, rock features. It's not a perfect bowl. And some of the well locations could be adjacent to some hard rock that's buried. Uh, we're in a very volcanic part of the state. Um, some areas, like the deep well area, might have uh, areas where there's very little groundwater, and some well may come up actually dry uh, because of geologic formations. It's complex, it's dynamic, and all you can see to try and identify that is what the wells are providing for information, which are just little windows here and there in a very, it's not a big aquifer, but it's a very big, we only have like 100 windows showing you what's really down there. It becomes very complex. Main point is, we're in overdraft, and most of us are producing water from this little area right here. And um, and then everything is flowing to the north toward the Verde River. So what we're pumping, it, that's flowing to the north. What we're intercepting is not making its way to the upper Verde or to the, the big Chino subbasin over in the lake area, the headwaters of the Verde River. Everything in here that's flowing, very limited aquifer space here, that's all part of the upper Agua Fria watershed and river system. So it's two diverse uh, watersheds there. So total city limits of both Prescott and Prescott Valley are completely within the AMA? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Please feel free to interrupt me anytime. <laughs> so I want to cover some of the rights. Um, it's important that we all kind of understand these rights equally. So let's look at the various types. Um, the first right uh, referred to as an irrigation grandfathered right. An irrigation grandfather right confers a right to irrigate specific plots of land that had been irrigated with groundwater between 1975 and <coughs> 1980. Land without an irrigation grandfathered right may not irrigate with groundwater. Under the Arizona Groundwater Management Act, irrigate means to apply water to two or more acres for, to land to produce plants or parts of plants for sale or consumption, or for use as growing plants for feed or livestock. An irrigation grandfathered right may not be sold apart from the associated land. <coughs> in our little piece of trivia. An irrigation grandfather right <coughs> specifies how much groundwater may be used, and that amount will vary over time according to the formula established by the Prescott Active Management Area Management Plans. Irrigation grandfather rights can be converted to a Type 1 or an assured water supply. It can be extinguished and retired permanently, converted into an assured water supply, which I'll talk about a little bit more here in a second. Do those ever dry up or go away over a period of time? Is that a lifetime and potential damage? They reduce towards the year 2025, which is the goal of safe field. They'll, they'll be reduced down to some uh, some volume <coughs> amount. Their grandfather, uh, obviously, especially with takings uh, laws and so forth. But the Groundwater Management Act acknowledged those rights preexisted when the Groundwater Management Act uh, the code was created in 1980. So they're established by. The, the way they, they're being reduced is to try and incentivize, in Arizona this is a, a generalized incentivization statewide, converting irrigation or irrig irrigation to municipal and industrial usages. Traditionally, irrigation lands use maybe six or seven acre feet per acre, where m and may use uh, one to three acres, uh, acre feet per acre. So something less than with irrigation. And of course, state right now is over total water usage is probably close to 70, 65, 70% is still water being used for agricultural purposes. So that's, that's a way to incentivize it. That's a great question. Type one right. It's associated with land permanently retired from farming and converted into a non-irrigation right. So you cannot use this water to irrigate, which was the previous right. And this would be an example like building a new industrial plant or even potentially a subdivision. The right, like an irrigation grandfather right, may be conveyed only with the land. You cannot leave the land. The maximum amount of groundwater may be pumped each year using a type one right is three acre feet per acre. 
Water usage must meet AMA management requirements, which are conservation requirements. How that water is used must, must be used e efficiently, and the water um, for this right must be withdrawn upon the lands associated with the water right. So it's used in the lands, it's pumped in the lands, it's used for purposes that meet the conditions uh, with, with the AMA requirements. This is a type two non-irrigation water right. So groundwater withdrawn for a type two water right can only be used for non-irrigation again purposes, the right is based on historical pumping of groundwater for non-irrigation use and equals the maximum amount pumped in any one year between 1975 and 1980. Examples of non-irrigation use include industry, livestock watering, and golf courses. Type 2 rights are the most flexible because they can be sold separately from the land or a well, meaning they are transferable. So going back to the AMA picture, if someone had a type 2 right, they could either sell that right from a well in Chino Valley all the way over to the southeast part of the AMA and either lease it or sell it to Prescott Valley. And they can, with the Department of Water Resource Approval, put that right on a well in the southeast corner of the AMA. They're transferable anywhere in the AMA. That's, that's the way the code is written. So Mark, how would, do people know what kind of right they have on their land? Most people do because they're issued certificates by the state, especially when they have to report annually what those type two, type one, or other irrigation right in the AMA, all, all water usage, groundwater usage has to be reported anyway. So I hope they know what they have. They should. This is a very important one, the service area groundwater right. So most Arizonans receive domestic water through service area rights. Um, service area rights authorize cities, towns, private water companies to, to withdraw groundwater to serve their customers. But there's something very special about this right. There's no maximum volume of groundwater attached to this right. This is what the town is using to serve its customers. So it's expected that these service areas will grow. Um, there's a very specific point that you'll continue to grow this service area to meet new customer um, that hook onto your system. And, um, and even with a subdivision, which has some unique requirements, which I'll touch on in a little bit, um, eventually, once that is issued by the state and authorized to move forward as a subdivision and having a requirement for 100 year assured water supply, we'll touch that in a sec, they'll eventually hook on to your water system if that's who they choose to have their water provided from the town. So, but this number will keep growing and growing, and that's what the Department of Water Resources wants it's to incentivize not having uh, independent wells but having everybody connected to a municipal service area because now they can instill conservation requirements future conservation requirements, and other specific uh, restrictions on what, how this water is being provided to customers. So this to incentivize everybody to be connected to the system. And obviously having universal rates, uncertainty of aquifer conditions, this, this really does make a lot of sense for, for within AMAs. Let's talk about uh, Chino Valley's water portfolio. So the town acquired irrigation grandfathered rights. IGFRs with the purchase of Old Hall Manor. These IGFRs were later converted into assured water supply credits, um, which most of them have been um, allocated to several developments within the town. And we have a very small uh, amount of those credits that are still available for use within uh, the town. These are primarily used for 100 year assured water supply requirements for developments that require that. The town also has 29.8 acre feet per year, a type one non irrigation water right and 32.8 type two non-irrigation water rights. Again, type two are transferable, we can move those around. Type one are associated with lands. I think type one is mainly being used. Mike, correct me out at the old home manor for the ball fields that were out there and some other that, land rights. So in my last presentation to you, I think it was in May, uh, we discussed the ordinances that were created to determine the cost of an assured water supply credit from water within the AMA. Uh, the town set up an ordinance. For water that's derived in the AMA by the town, the cost per acre foot is $25,000, which means $25,000 for a, a 100 acre foot block of water. It means the town will deliver one acre foot a year for 100 years, or in total 100 acre feet. The town also set an ordinance that if the town had water, it would be uh, developing from outside the active management area. The cost per acre foot of that assured water supply credit is $45,000. And it's assumed that the, why that price is much higher is because that's water outside the AMA. It's going to cost a lot more to bring that water into the AMA, which we'll touch on. Does 
Ten in total, forty-five thousand or forty thousand, five thousand a year. <laughs> it's it's forty-five thousand per acre foot, and that would be a, a one-time purchase. One -time. Yeah, it would be assumed then from that going forward, they would that the town would purchase that. Um, we deliver an acre foot. They bought one acre foot for a hundred years. One acre foot a year. So we also discussed that most of the IGFRs were associated with Oho Manor were historically converted into an assured water supply, and that most of them have been devoted to development for the town. We also discussed that meaning um, that the town's only increasing renewable assured water supply is reclaimed water. So as the town's sewer collection system, its reclamation and recharge grows, it, it's the only <coughs> renewable supply the town has. It's considered a renewable supply. That is a supply that will continue to increase, and that will be one of your um, opportunities for potential partnering and for assured water supply needs. Uh, we discussed that, there, that these reclaimed water effluent, their effluent credits are owned by the town, and within the town ordinance it stated that the town may decide to sell these credits to a development. So again, the ordinance is quite clear, the town may decide to, because when a development comes in, they're going to actually, when they hook onto the sewer collection system as part of the requirements of the town, they're going to generate wastewater, which gets, gets converted through the reclamation process into reclaimed water, which can be recycled, put back into the ground, and reused. So the town may decide to partner with some of these interests. The town currently does not have a policy or ordinance that provides guidance on who these future development partners would be, uh, but there are plenty of or plenty of plenty of documents that can assist with. I think part of this part two of the agenda here is to kind of have this discussion on a trying to set a policy on what is the top premier customers the town wants to partner with if it wants to sell reclaimed water or potentially other water supplies, who should the town partner with? Some of these plans that kind of guide some of these policy uh, discussions, your general plan, you have a strategic economic and development plans, you also have the old home, old home manor uh, master plan, and you have interest in jobs, tax base, um, a positive impact on the town, and you can also look at too, development that comes in that actually is going to use water and give most of that water back to a sewer collection treatment and recharge system versus development that comes in that may consume all of that water embedded in a product like that's called a water bottling company or Pepsi Cola, whatever that may be, just generically speaking. Um, they may come in and want to use that water embedded in their products and then that water gets now shipped out of this location. You get very little back as part of that renewable supply. So those are things to think about as we have this, this conversation. And as I discussed, the Assured Water Supply Program um, and define the town's total water portfolio and access in the total water portfolio for the remainder of the presentation, I encourage you to think about that very question. What type of development should the town be inclined to partner with and allow access to the town's water portfolio uh, for its reclaimed or its other water supplies? Because they are very limited. Um, so what is the Assured Water Supply? It's a condition of proving that a new subdivision or a yes, yeah, subdivision plat, it could be residential, commercial, or industrial, um, has a water supply sufficient for 100 years to the satisfaction of the Arizona Department of Water Resources. What is a subdivision? It's defined under real estate law, under ARS 32-2101, as a land divided into six or more parcels with at least one parcel or lot having an area less than 36 acres. That will be critical in a second. All subdivisions, including those for residential, commercial, or industrial uses, are subject to the assured water supply requirements. Can I stop you there just yeah. to avoid confusion? In municipalities, when we talk about subdivisions, they can be as small as two um, if the street's involved, or typically in municipalities, four or more is a subdivision. But what the state uses here is the, the county definition or the overall state definition outside of a municipality. That's why you see the six. So it is technically possible to have a subdivision inside the town that does <coughs> not need a certificate of assured water supply. That's correct. If, the sub, if a subdivision, how we want to <coughs> the, the term subdivision, doesn't meet that requirement, then we'll use our service area right and we not have an assured water supply requirement. That's why your service area right is so valuable as well, because you can connect on all those things all day long, big industrial complexes. The key, too, is even apartment complexes. You could have 500 acres that are going to be put into 10,000 residential apartment complex, 
and it might occupy one parcel, it's not a subdivision, you can serve water to it all day long. Because it's not a real estate transaction, it's one parcel, it may be considered, uh, because of the number of units and so forth, a subdivision in the terms town, terminology, but according to the state, doesn't need this definition, and it would be exempt from the short water supply. And nobody owns real estate, it's a 12 month or less lease is primarily so apply that to Old Home Manor. If we uh, sell lots, they need the AWS. If we lease the lots, they, they, they fall under our assured water supply. If you sell lots that are going to be meeting this definition, if you have, a, let's say, a, a, a plat, let's say it's an industrial complex plat, you're going to sell uh, 10 lots, and they um, meet this requirement, they're going to need a shared water supply. If you sell one lot at a time, this is where it gets a little tricky because the department doesn't want anybody to circumvent the loop, make a loophole around the assured water supply. So if you've got a master plan that looks at selling, let's say it's 200 acres and it's gonna consist of industrial, light industrial, some heavy industrial, commercial, and maybe some apartment complexes. And overall, it's, it looks like a subdivision, it smells like a subdivision, and it quacks like a subdivision, it's a subdivision. And it's probably gonna meet these requirements. It's gonna probably have that. You can't say well, we're gonna sell only one lot at a time and we're gonna use our service area, right? you approach it from a short water supply standpoint. What if you lease the land? Different story. Leasing land is not a sale transaction, so it would not be this definition. If they're all leases, then it would, it would, it would be an exemption from the short water supply. But convincing you probably have to have a long-term agreement with, let's say, a landlord is gonna invest, let's say, 10 million into an industry or a complex, they wanna have assurances they're gonna get the first right of refusal every year to renew the lease, right? right? So they maybe wanna have a, a 20 or 30 or 40 year assurance, right? Great question. Okay, a land subdivisions that create parcels, all of which are larger than 36 acres, are classified as a subdivided lands, and they do not require an assured water supply. Another notable exemption, uh, again, to the assured water supply requirements are the apartment complex aspect. So you may have a number of these 36 acres that then cover in apartment complexes or something else, but they're not falling, they're exempt from the assured water supply. So just, you see, I think some of the large property owners out in the central part of uh, the Chino uh, Valley area or Southern Park by the airport had large tracts of land. They were, they were all parcel on 36 acre parcels. That's why that number is very familiar. This 36 acres exemption for the lowest uh, acreage to exempt out of the assured water supply program. So there are two ways to meet the 100 year assured water supply requirements with the state laws. Before we hop into the assured water supply program real quick, I want to talk about the two, two ways to get it. So if, again, if you're a landowner, you want to subdivide land, you're required to have an assured water supply. There's one of two ways to get the 100 year assured water supply uh, approvals. The first is obtaining a certificate of assured water supplies, and which is only issued by the Arizona Department of Water Resources. This process is very costly to the landowner. So the landowner has to go out and prove that there's certain things to be met based on what's required under the rule, which I'm gonna cover in the next slide. Usually it means developing a very expensive groundwater flow model to show there's actual water molecules under the property and accounting for that. So if you're a landowner and you have, let's say, 20 units that you want to sell, it's by the subdivision, needs an assured water supply. We're not designated, Prescott is, um, which I'll, I'll hop on next. But you got to do a growing model. If you're only selling 20 lots, it could cost a quarter million dollars to a half million dollars of complexity to do a growing model to show there's physical water there that meets some of the requirements. And I'll discuss all the requirements. And how long does that usually take? Well, the permit process, or certification from the department, it's the timeline is probably um, a year or more to get that certificate. But the groundwater model, just to get some of the work done, may take six months, nine months, or even longer with complexity. And usually as part of that one year or so uh, cert cert uh, certification process by the state, there's usually some uh, requirements, additional information that the department requests. So I would say in all, on average, a year and a half to two years is probably, is probably a good rule of thumb to think about. And so if someone comes to the town and they're from California and they bought 500 acres, they're like, hey, we're ready to subdivide, and they have no idea on the assured water supply, mm -hmm. and they want to start subdividing you know, six months from now, it's not going to happen. It's two years to probably get that certificate. If they have no water, they have to go out in the market and buy water the town decides not to sell some of its water to them. So there's a lot of due diligence required for landowners when they are out of state or not familiar with the Assured Water Supply Program through the Press and Active Management Area. So a certificate, it's issued by the Department of Water Resource, that's one way, and a landowner then applies for that 
With the Department of Water Resources, it's out of our hands. We have no part, we're not the regulator, the town is not. They go to the state and take care of all of that. We say, see you back down the road, and we're ready to get that approved. The second is, we can make it really easy on landowners, and the town could become what's called a designated water provider, where the town takes on proving how much water is physically here, and meeting a number of criteria that would allow the town to become designated. Now, I'll talk about the challenges on what that, what that looks like. But that's what the city of Prescott is. The city of Prescott is a designated water provider. So landowners go right to the city. They negotiate their own deals. It's a done deal. The state's not involved. The city's taking care of all that due diligence and makes it very simple, very easy, very fast and efficient for land to be then divided and developed and, and go into production, say the city of Prescott. But they There's still have cost. a limited supply, right? Right. There's still limits of supply and so forth, and they have to meet certain requirements. And that designation is not forever. It's required by law to be renewed every 15 years. So you have to meet certain requirements. And if you can't, let's say that 15 year goes by, they're going to renew your designation to your point, and you're lacking physical water, they can say, we're going to go ahead and rescind your designation. Here's now what you're designated for. Everything else is kind of the Wild West. You know, by fencing themselves, goes back to the old certification process. Mm -hmm. Answer certificate. Real quick, right? Yes. Uh, in this town, we have some areas are served by Prescott Water, so if they are being served by Prescott Water, do they still need a certificate of assured water supply? No, the city of Prescott is a designated provider. Anything 660 feet by any distribution line by the city of Prescott that they want to hook into would be considered being a Prescott designated provider and they would work with Prescott. They would not have to get a certificate. So a new subdivision if they're served by Prescott? Works with Prescott. We would just need to have that that's correct. That they agreed to serve as part of their designation. They'd have to then look at the total water volume, the budget for that development, and, and account for that as a now commitment for 100 years and put that in their spreadsheet of here's the all the water in Chino and in Prescott that we've accounted for. That comes off Prescott's board. That's Our correct. Mm -hmm. Not ours. No. It'd be in the Prescott's if they so chose to do that. So the water provider is service area, not town. They're, they're, wherever they have pipes in the ground, 660 feet connects onto it, and, or some even further ones that run a line and connect to Prescott, um, that's their designated water provider area, and which is within the town of Chino Valley. We have overlapping service areas. One's designated, well, the town's not designated, but if they connect to Prescott, no certificate. Okay, I just want to talk about the complexity in a very general sense of what it takes to get a certificate or become a designated water provider. These are all the components of what you have to prove to the state of Arizona to become either a designated water provider or get a certificate. And, and at the foundation of all of it is the, the, the big three blocks at the bottom. Physical water availability, that again goes to a hydrologic study. Whether the town wants to become designated, we do a town-wide groundwater model showing how much water is available to the town for its few current, future, and, and predicted growth or the landowner gets that through groundwater model to show how much water is physically available under that piece of property through the same type of a much smaller groundwater model. What you have to show is actually water molecules that can serve customers every year for 100 years. Do those molecules exist? And there's certain requirements that the department would look at to make sure that if you did pump for 100 years, what would the impacts be to your land and to others around you? Again, back in the AMA, also the AMA, you can impact your neighbors all day long, that's not a problem, but in the AMA, different set of rules, you cannot impact other well owners. You may have to reduce your pumping. It might limit how much water you can actually physically have on your property if there's others around you who already locked up some of that water. Legal water availability. How, how much legal water rights do you have? You can drill a well all day long on your property. You can drill many wells. If you don't have a legal withdrawal authority to, dr to pump that water, you're not pumping a gallon of water. You can drill wells, not a problem, but you have no legal withdrawal authority. So you've got to show you have actual paper documents giving you, granting you legal access to pump some volume of water, whether that's you know specific water rights, which I've already covered, or other uh, short water supply credits that makes a landowner has bought from somewhere in the active management area. And lastly, the water had to show that it would be continuously available for 100 years. So there will be no interrupt, interruptions of water whatsoever. So you've got to show all these things. Then on top of that, which these are very costly, <coughs> You have to show a financial capability. So how are you going to build infrastructure to serve? And then how are you going to treat that water 
to meet the safe drinking water standards to all of your water users? And lastly, how are you going to conform the water uses to the conservation the management plans and goals, the, again, the plan conservation efficiencies that are part of the laws of the Prescott Active Management Area, and the goal of 2025, which is safe yield, meaning how you're not, how you're going to meet that goal of safe yield. What you're pumping now will be um, put back in the ground and recharged. You have to account for that. So, Mark, for the physical water availability, because of Prescott having their agreement with CBID, we don't have that opportunity to be able to prove that we can that we have enough water here to become a designated provider. Well, that's Without part of it. Important. How much physical water is with, that the town has access to within its service area right now? It's a very small service area, right? You have a, you have a limited number of customers. We're not serving the town wide. So how much water do you physically have access to? And of course, in there, you have to take into consideration Prescott's pumping. They've locked up some volume of that water so you can't impact them. So they were designated. They've locked a big chunk of groundwater. So when you become designated, not impact their designated provider. Next is legal water availability. The legal, how much legal rights do you have? The town has very limited legal access to the groundwater. Prescott has <coughs> more legal rights because they have certain things they have done as part of the designation and part of the process when the AMA was created. So they have actually more legal rights to, to groundwater than the town does. Did they get um so they got their designation. Now it's a, never mind. I already know the answer to it. Never mind. Go ahead. <laughs> Can you get a designation if somebody's already been within the area? You understand what I'm saying? You show Prescott mm -hmm. covering all this area. You you can have overlapping designated areas. Uh, to think that's where you're going. They have a part of their area in Chino Valley is designated. You can designate, you may have overlapping areas, but you still have to, how you account for the physical water, you can impact it. You may be far away from their wells. Their customers may be here, um, but you may be pulling your water with their customers, but their wells may be far away, so it might be a problem. If their wells are right next to where your wells are, that, or your future wells, that could be a problem. So them being a designated provider of this whole area does not block us from the country. It would not. Mm -hmm. or, yes? Now, if we, start, if we could pump water from Little Chino down to the town, how would that in fact impact all of this? Are you referring to the Big Chino aquifer, the yeah, HIA yeah, water, yeah, the historic? Sure, the Big Chino. So the town, uh, I'll get to that, but I, I'll answer your question. The town has purchased uh, many acres out in the, big, the, the lower part of the Big Chino at the Wine Glass Acre Ranch. Um, and I can't remember the total number of acres, but it's less than 200 acres. The town has purchased. It had an option agreement on a piece of property. The town has a permit issued by the Department of Water Resources to actually import water into the AMA, which we also have a law that governs that as well. We have the only permit issued by the state, by the way. If we were to pump that water, and say we did all the things that were necessary to mitigate and look at all those components and we got water flowing into, into Chino Valley, that would change potentially the whole world for Chino Valley. Number one is we could not pump limited groundwater in the AMA. We could now use a much larger aquifer system that water we can then uh, sell it has a higher cost to it, but it's costing more to get that water in here. And it may allow the town to actually become a designated provider because now you have a, a legal, a legal, a much larger physical water supply, and it's continuous. It's granted it's continuous. We've already proven that through a pump test out there um, showing 18,000 acre feet every year for 100 years is available to wine glass acres, uh, the ranch. So that's way more than what the acreage could even pump um, what it can even provide from a legal standpoint, three acre feet per acre is the limit. There's only 600, I think, 650 or so acres of HIA water. That's, that's close, but it's it's right there. So it can meet that requirement. So part of that's already met. So to your point, that could really help the town if it was able to import the water. Yeah, we could probably easier become a designated provider. I think, I think I, well, I've had discussions with the department that worked for the town, the, and the department thought that would be the way the town could become designated. Importation. Yes. Okay, so right now we're a non-designated water provider. Correct. And we can pump whatever we need to supply our customers. So the benefit of becoming a dedicated service, is that right? Did no, I say designated. That? designated uh, service provider is just so that we can make our own decisions on development. And it will save the, uh, the landowners a considerable cost and time. It will take right. two years okay, to so get a, a potential certificate and it will cost them a lot of money to hire a consulting firm to do all that work to prove these things 
um, the financials, the physical, all that stuff. It will cost a lot of money. And then when they come, let's say they do all that, and they come into the town, and suddenly say, oh, by the way, here's your impact fees, they feel like, oh my gosh, you know, this really financially, and then this small, small land owner, then it really is financially impactful. Versus if you have really good projects that are on small pieces of property, if you're designated, it becomes them walking into the town and say, here's what we want to do, can you, you want to partner with us? And it can help incentivize. If you have a policy that says, here's what we want, we're going to partner with water, we're going to, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, that's what we're looking for for partners. When that landowner is doing, you know, uh, looking at just doing residential, they say, I'm going to go to Lake Commercial and be a tax center for the town, and I'm going to just change my whole concept, and I'm going to come in and do that because that's what they're looking at as a way to partner, and they may look at different projects. But, but to your point, it just becomes, you control your destiny. The state is out of the whole process, other than the town becoming designated to the state one time every 15 years, and that's it. Right, but we still have a, a set water portfolio that we still are limited. Very limited. Yeah. But right. No, I mean, even if we yeah. became a designated water provider, we still have your portfolio. You have your portfolio, right. right. And then <coughs> it's just a decision on what's the biggest bang for your buck. That's correct. And again, it goes to, um, then, to that point, how efficient, you know, trying to keep with the, the greatest quality of life, sense of community, um, how efficient can you make every acre foot stretch? Um, you know, the, the town had a certificate issued um, in 2000, I think, eight. Um, it was close to eight homes per acre foot. It was the most efficient uh, certificate ever issued in the Prescott Active Management Area. It's in Chino Valley. Hmm. Um, so can that water stretch a lot further? I bet it can. Again, 60% of water is used outdoors. Um, you can still have that great quality of life, the look of Chino Valley, and still preserving your water and trying to stretch every acre foot. Plus it will only help with having land development put there to buy that water, which is expensive, from the town. Um, they want to stretch it as far as they can too. So they're going to incentivize their own efficiency to try and look at what that works out to be, you know, per, per home. If an acre foot goes for eight instead of three and they have to pay 25000 well, it probably pencils out pretty good for them. But it does, to your point, it, it designation is just a much more efficient and effective way for the town to control its destiny and work with landowners versus the state getting involved, which is a whole level of complexity. If we draw from the Big Chino Aquifer, do we have to put our Water that is a great question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That is a great <laughs> question. Um, and I'm going to cover that a little bit more, but that is kind of the crux of it. Um, I can assure you that I can say this here that um, with probably about 99.9% .9 confidence that if you pull anything from the Big Chino, you're going to have to mitigate whatever your impacts are. And what that looks like probably is going to be the only water supply you have to put back out there is going to be reclaimed water, most likely. So what volume does that look like? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. You're going to have to further studies that are going to be needed to, let's say you pumped uh, 500 acre feet from wine glass acres, you know, and then you found a recharge site, maybe where the Drake cement plant <coughs> is uh, doing the aggregate work that is completed, which is between the pumping center and the headwaters of Verde, and you get to put back half of your reclaimed water to mitigate what you're pumping out. That's still a volume that can no longer go for development. It's, it's in allowing the HI to be imported, which is going for development. So that gets back to an efficiency question. But it's a great question because it's a, it's, I guarantee you mitigations will be required just from all like SRP, um, Fish and Wildlife, Chino Valley doesn't want to impact the Verde River, which is the last flowing river in the state, those kind of things. So a plan will have to be created to mitigate. And I would, the only water supply you're going to have is reclaimed water. So then we're, we'd be looking at putting in two lines, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. And that's what was looked at initially why the $45,000 for water that's developed outside the AMA was developed because it, the, the thought is it be much more costly and that'll help pay for what is needed for um, the infrastructure capital and debt service and also the O&M. There's a lot of O&M with that as well. Great question. Thank you. So you got a dry piece of property. <laughs> No water associated with it, it's a dry lot subdivision. And these are allowed under state law. Um, because there's no water rights associated with them, uh, the development cannot acquire water rights. I say they couldn't afford to pop, purchase any water rights in the AMA or there's none that were um, available. Um, they can apply for a dry lot subdivision. Um, so they'd be using exempt walls uh, for each homeowner within that dry lot subdivision. However, 
the state still governs this very similar to the assured water supply program. There are specific requirements. So you just can't say, dry lots, here you go, rubber stamp it, off, off you go. They had to go do a hydrologic model as well and show there's physical water for those exempt wells to come from, from every one of those. And they had to model that for 100 years. If the water table drops more than 400 feet below the land surface, in that 100 year course, the department will reject it. Mm -hmm. That land will not be developed. And the only way it'll be able to develop, if it can't do this, will be by trying to figure out a water, a water right and partnering with the town or a water provider. It might be a private as well. Also, if, let's say they, it, it is okay for this. The water table won't drop below 400 feet, so they met the first requirement. If any of that raw groundwater does not meet safe drinking water standards for arsenic, nitrates, or fluoride, or anything like that, the department will not issue it because they don't expect every homeowner to maintain and operate a independent uh, water treatment system in the homes. That's not what the department will do. The department will reject it if, if both for water quality and for physical availability. So dry lots are not a for sure thing. They still have requirements. It will take them the same process to go hire a consulting company to do a groundwater model hmm. and then go to the apartment and apply for this. It's a lot of costs. And Frank, don't we have one of these right now in the hopper? Uh, it goes in and out of the hopper, but yes, they're <laughs> trying. Whether to connect to a private water utility or do a dry lot, right? Uh -huh. yeah. Nice get mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> so all groundwater is considered not a renewable water supply. This is on the same page. Groundwater is a fossil water supply. It took thousands and thousands of years to fill these basins up, both Little Chino and Big Chino. It's not renewable. Uh, surface water is. Reclaimed water is. Um, just as a point of reference. So all the rights that the town has, service area right, type 1, type 2, I2FAR is either use them as for irrigation for crops or convert for sure water supply. Those are rights to groundwater. So, there are two uh, water supplies in the town's portfolio that could be used for new development. The town is generating renewable water supplies through its sewer collection, treatment, and recharge project. The town is currently generating about 284 acre feet a year. It's recharging back into the ground that reclaim water. So, the sewer system, I think it's slightly larger or very similar to the amount of water that we're serving to the potable customers. It's because we have more sewer connections than we do water connections. That's why the two are the same. Normally, it's kind of a 60-40, you'll, you'll give up all your water and then 60% gets used by the customer, you get back 40% to your sewer plant and then you can treat it and recharge it. But it's higher energy when you have more sewer connections. The town has purchased several properties within the Big Chino, going back to the question earlier, Big Chino Basin, uh, which have been classified by AWR as historically irrigated um, during that time frame that, that the requirements were met. And to date, the town could import uh, 445 acre feet per year for 100 years based on the property the town has uh, put in its possession of ownership. Mark, can you put that in context, like 445, maybe you already did, but I missed it. Um, will service how many, if you were just gonna build homes, if, how many if would you, that? If on, on the, I'll say the loose average today, right. let's just say it's four homes, uh, what is that, 2,000? I mean, 1,600 to 2,000 homes somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay. If you're able to get 10 homes per acre foot, just hypothetically throwing out there, wow, you just, got a much larger number. That could be industrial complexes. Um, that goes back to the question, um, which we're going to talk more about, which is who do you want to partner with this volume of water? Is it, do you want to be a better community and have just residential, which have a pretty high impact on water, they don't give a whole lot back? Or do you want to balance that with commercial, industrial, especially if an industrial customer comes in, let's say it's a chip manufacturer, they're going to do solar panels here in Chino Valley. Those plants usually traditionally give back about 90% of that water back to a reclamation facility. So they're very water intensive, but they get a lot of water back to the reclamation facility that you can then use over and over again versus residential, you only get 40% back. So industrial complex, generate tax dollars, give most of that water back, you can put it back in the ground and then sell it again. So you've got this renewable supply that's ever increasing. Where a residential may be a little bit different, not saying they're bad or, or anything that, is that they have more of an impact on your water supply. Unless, you change your ordinances and you make them become very efficient, very conservation minded. And that's that's a process. Or commercial, commercial too, it could be various commercial enterprises that would be. But on a home base, um, you know, three to four homes, that's times four forty five or ten if you're very efficient um, and don't lose what you know value is, you can see a big difference. Um, 
The main points for consideration are the town does not yet have the ability to import the HI, oil, the HI water at this point. Um, and, but it has had the ability to use um, its effluent towards development projects. So um, the town may desire to partner when make reclaimed water available for sale. So you may have a partner come in, a landlord come in, wants to partner with the town, and you say, well, we've got some, we've got some available reclaimed water. Just keep in mind that some of that reclaimed water has already been designated for some of the assured water supply certificates that exist in the town. So not all that reclaimed water, 284, is really for sale. And that's part of a, a water management you know, from a, a spreadsheet standpoint. We've given, uh, we've partnered with, like I say, Highlands Ranch, Bright Star, others that required a certificate, and they were then they purchased their reclaimed water from the town. So they have some volume in their certificate that the town has to recover every year and deliver back to those customers every year to meet that certificate requirement. So not all that water is really for sale. So we'll keep that in mind, but some. Some percent of that is, probably a, a larger percent. Um, and you can make that available today. Um, but back to the questions I've heard, if we're gonna import HIA water at some point in the future, and we have to mitigate that, and probably reclaim water will be the tool to bring reclaim water out to mitigate pumping, then how much is left out of that amount? Or a future volume, especially if you're importing all that water. Or you buy other HIA water rights, or you partner with other entities who have HIA water, what volume will be left? That's, this is really the policy discussion. I don't know how much of this reclaimed water will be available when you have obligations in the AMA to put water in the ground and recover for current existing certificates, and you may have to bring a large volume back out to the big chino to offset importing HIA water. So maybe the real crux of this is that your HIA water is your real water portfolio for the future. Your reclaim is overall a, a mitigation tool to some degree or another, to some volume. And that's gonna require a groundwater model, a mitigation strategy to truly to really quantify that, which you don't have today. Uh, a roadmap of what does that look like? What is that volume? So you really have those numbers that define what water you can partner with landowners. Because again, they do wanna partner with the town. They wanna to come in and find some water, some uh, opportunities, and, and the town is the, probably the premier water provider. Prescott, um, other water provider and other privates are, the town is going to at some point, its, it's destiny is to try and be a sole water provider throughout the community and, and, and attempt, obviously, same with sewer. So the main point here is because the sewer uh, collection area is so small, you can increase that number by trying to expand your sewer collection treatment and recharge program. At some point, 50 years from now, maybe the entire town will be sewer and you will be generating a very large volume of sewering um, and, and collection and treatment and recharge. Mm -hmm. But today, that's what you have. Um, the future is uncertain, but um, obviously, to add value to land, sewer is required for a lot of the, of the land developments under ordinances. Um, you may have some areas that may just stick with uh, the septic, private septic system, but this is one way to increase that number, and it costs money to do so. Obviously, capital costs, o &M infrastructure and so forth, and, and a reclamation plant that has to be uh, maintained. So I want to kind of hop into the, the future challenges now. Um, what does the future look like? And some things to consider. Again, keeping that question uh, in your mind. So the town service area right can continue to expand and serve non-subdivision development. So keep that, that's your benefit. Use that to the maximum that you can uh, by serving all those customers that you can partner with today using that service area uh, right. Um, anything less fiber, less uh, lots, um, you can go ahead and do that. That's that's a benefit. Mark, can you just talk to service area right where it comes to um, commercial development and a subdivision and? Sure. Anything um, six or more lots under real estate law, that's either residential, commercial, or industrial is considered a subdivision under real estate laws, will require a certificate of assured water. Anything less, so fiber less, that are residential, commercial, or industrial, can you service your way. So some things with commercial development will be the strategy on how they're created. Correct. To whether or not to they get to the five lots or. For example, um, and I'm not a, uh, a land development expert or real estate expert, but how I understand certain things, the way in which you develop to, I think you're going, versus doing a subdivision, let's say for Ola Manor. Maybe it's preferential to do a PAD, 
um, which may be one big, huge parcel or two or four that will have little things that will fit into those. Um, and there's a way to look at that as a PAD may actually not require a certificate versus a subdivision. So, and Prescott Valley, as I'll say, has done a lot of PADs. They've been using their service area right to do that. Other cities throughout other AMAs have done the same thing as well. Um, just how you develop, you're not trying to circumvent um, the sure water supply requirements, but how you develop that. But again, how much control do you want to have? PADs, you know, the council may have less control versus subdivisions, you have P and Z in your council, meeting all the requirements of the code, right? So PADs are a little more loose, if you will. So it's just food for thought, uh, but how you develop that point, it's a great question, may determine. Uh, but anything residential, commercial, industrial, fiberglass, um, energy service area, right? And how it gets developed is up to the town or that man. Do you see Jack? That was a good question. He said. <laughs> I got <a> break. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, developments that do not come to the table with any water or not enough water to uh, meet their 100 year assured water supplies will look to the town as a water partner. And there are very limited water rights remaining within the AMA that could be used to meet the, the water requirements, and they will be costly. So there's a very small, limited amount of water rights left in the Prescott Active Management Area. And if you go on that market, I heard it's close to $20,000 an acre foot for a short water supply. If you get other type rights, they're very costly, very similar in cost. So, and those costs have fluctuated based on the market demand. It's a supply and demand, typical uh, economy type of uh, diagram, but it, it's just very costly. And if they have dry land, they're going to have to get water supplies if the town cannot supply the water to them. So the town bought mostly HIE water outside of the AMA. Um, but what Prescott and Prescott Valley was the type two water rates that they have out there on a ranch? Was they have HIA water. HIA water too. Yeah, okay. the water ranch has a thousand acres of historically irrigated acre, and they also have a. Um, it's in statute. A. Um, <coughs> they've got about three thousand acre feet that can be pumped for HIA um, that was historically irrigated on the ranch, and they also have a legal right to pump water from the big channel that was defined in statute. Uh, I think in total we're looking at about eleven to twelve thousand acre feet. Oh wow! Um, I think it's eight thousand or so in statute. We have the other three, might be eleven or so, but it's 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 a large quantity of water. They have the ability to import. So um, importation is huge to them. I mean, they've is, got to if they need it. You know, <coughs> some have said that they can conserve their way to build up. Um, if, and I don't know how much I probably I know back in the day when it was. 2007, I think the project was estimated between three and four hundred million dollars. Well, of course, mm -hmm. the cost of doing those right. projects go up every year. Yeah. Now it might be five hundred million dollars. Ten years from now, it might be a, a billion dollars. I don't know. It's, it's going to cost a lot of money, and yeah. if they don't, if they can conserve their way to build up, that costs a lot less than anything that to build that. That looks like a road to success versus all the political controversy with building something. Else. Yeah. As long as they hit on it now, so. Prescott and Prescott Valley are also looking at the HIA water and importing that. So they would also, like Chino Valley, probably look to mitigate that with some sort of recharge or something as well. So the original plan way back in 2008 was to pump from wine glass acre that HIA water along with the time that the town had an executed agreement with Chino Grande, which was the owner at the time of the CBCF ranch import their water and be a water broker for them. They have close to a thousand acres that are historically irrigated. So three thousand acre feet pumped from the wine glass along with the town's HIA water. Coming into they were going to pay for it, a delivery system and mitigation system. And the town also had, um, I think it's still valid, an MOU with US Fish and Wildlife on mitigation plans. The town had an option agreement on a 74 acre uh, parcel of land that was east of the pumping center at Wine Glass, at the, where the Drake uh, Cement Company was excavating that property. And they were excavating that because the town had an uh, option agreement with the property owner that they would excavate that property for a recharge basin. And the town was the next step was to look at how it could mitigate and move water in and back out to mitigate and keep the, uh, the headwaters and that lower part of the aquifer sustained. So that was the plan. But if Prescott or Prescott Valley want to import, they also probably need to look at recharging as well. They'll have to do there. I think have signed a mitigation agreement with some of the project um, that would require them to do some mitigation components. That might be 
Obviously, if they turn off all irrigation out of the property, that's some mitigation, but it may not be all the mitigation. They, have, they may have to export <coughs> water out to the Big Chino and strategically place that water into areas that are going to maintain the aquifer and the river. Yes, sir. Does anyone currently pump HIA water out of there? No. Or no, they just have the ability to, but no one's currently doing that. Yeah, statute defines uh, only cities and towns can actually import uh, the water, the HIA water. Nobody else, no private entities can do that. It's only cities and towns can import HIA water. But no one is currently. But the town of Chino Valley has the only permit issued by the state. Um, we did an analysis uh, in 2008 and showing that 18,000 acre feet could be pumped from that location every year for um, we got a permit issued by the state. The state then rescinded its policy on those permits and it has to go through a new rule, a new rule process to develop rules on how those permits would be issued, but we were already granted into a permit before that changed. So we're grandfathered in and uh, Reagan the town has the only permit issued by the state. Can we only use it for us or can we sell that? You can do whatever you want. You can sell it if you don't want to utilize that for the town. You can sell it to another community. You can sell it to whomever. Mainly it'd be sold, you know, it's going to be sold either way. It's going to be sold through the interaction of land development in Chino, uh, I think was the predominant. But if, you, if you're referring to the Chino Grande HI water, um, there was a certain percent that would be sold in Chino because Chino was growing very rapidly in 2005 and 6, as were the other communities. But part of that could be sold in other communities. Um, it, was, it was not the town's water. It was their water, and we were, their, we were going to broker it and help sell the water but a lot of it would be used in Chino. So it was to the advantage of Chino to try and sell as much as they could in Chino Valley to try and help with the dry lands that they use in Chino. But they gotta go through town to get their water to them. Or at least, at least to their pumping stations here. Yes, that's correct. Well, they don't have to. Well, they go around, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> they very expensive. Yeah. Be so cheaper. well put. <laughs> they don't have to. They may very well go around. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Does all three have water up here if they all decide to? one water line instead of three water yes. lines to share the cost. Imagine that. The mm -hmm. term I love using, that's just near and dear. That's an outstanding thing. Regionalism. <laughs> <laughs> that got his attention. I love it. See, that's regionalism. five stars. Can you imagine having three pipes coming in or two that's pipes ridiculous. coming in? I mean, the, the, the water users, the, the citizens should be outraged. Mm -hmm. There should be yeah. one pipe for water coming in and one, out. And one going out for mitigation. Mm -hmm. All three cities or more could be working together to help <laughs> minimize all the costs. Imagine I firmly believe in that. We just um, charge them a lot of rent. Just charge them agencies. a lot of rent for the pipe we already put in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wheel it. Then they'll pipe it. Usually pipe. Well, you meter that. Everybody has their own water supply. Um, you know, if uh, there are three different owners of HIA water, one is owned by right now an option agreement. ITC is one. You have Prescott and Prescott Valley in the other, and then you have the towns HIA. So there's, there's three separate, but um, there's always room for part, additional partnerships, right? I think that that's a great regionalism is what I always believed in, you know, just working together and trying to solve regional issues and being in together. Otherwise, you're competing. Compete, competition for water in the state is just uh, so wrong. It should be working together and trying to minimize competition because it only drives prices up. And who pays for that? All your customers do. They'll have increased prices, which is not good for anybody. Um, so, uh, future challenges. Uh, the town can explore the expansion of the sewer collection, which I mentioned, the treatment system and recharge system, which will ensure wastewater is not contaminated the aquifer. We'll touch a little more on that. Contamination is a big issue here. But thoroughly treated and recharged back in the aquifer as a ever-increasing renewable water supply and also used for HIA water importation, which we already talked about. Um, water contamination is a area of concern. Uh, if the town can successfully import its HIA water uh, from the Big Chino, it would not only be a new 100-year assured water supply for a new desired development within the town, but this new water supply could also allow the town to become, when we talked about, a designated water provider <laughs> and allowing us to then work with development and not having those developments go to the Department of Water Resources. So this is a map of Chino Valley and all of the exempt wells uh, <coughs> in and around the area. So this is part of the AMA boundary. Chino Valley, um, and just let you know that a lot of these dots, um, the way the Department of Water Resources does their location is what's called a cadastral 10 acre center node. So if there are 100 properties in 10 acres and they each have a well, they'll all be one dot at the center of that 10 acre um, property. So when you see these dots, <laughs> this may be 20 wells, it could be, I just want to show you. 
This is a proliferation of exempt wells in the AMA and the surrounding areas. Mm -hmm. You can see the heavy density areas here in Chino and just outside certain areas here. Um, the Prescott AMA is in overdraft condition. It's more than two to one, so we're pumping more than twice what's naturally and artificially coming back in the ground. And some have even speculated it's three to one. The overdraft condition has or will impact well owners and require wells to be deepened or in some instances uh, currently like near the fringe aquifers, near the fringe parts of the aquifer like in West Chino, mm -hmm. the lands have permanently gone dry forever and ever to have. And I've, I've heard that some of those landowners have already done some uh, land valuations and their property values have been cut nearly in half. Mm -hmm. Hauling water sucks, but you become a great steward of water mm -hmm. conservation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've got to haul your own water. Absolutely. But um, this is a bigger issue because as we continue going overdraft, why would you want to be a water provider? Well, providing water to your customers will help them get out of the situation, right? Your residents, this would help those. And obviously it takes capital expenses, it takes time. And, but, but if you were a sole water provider throughout the entire town right now, no one would have, you know, your wells, the aquifer would be relaxed a little bit, they would have a water supply dependent. So, just shows you that there's an issue here. It's going to continue to get worse and worse. This aquifer is going to continue to move this way, and these, these lands will be affected either by having it deep in your wells or some of those lands will come to dry. Uh, yeah, it's almost a side issue, but on that map, that also shows uh, if you want to place a new well, those wells have established areas, so you may have trouble finding a place to put a well in the darker green areas, right? Um, not necessarily. These are all exempt wells. They're all exempt from, like, if you're referring to the wells facing well impact analysis, exempt wells are exempt. Wow. But what if we're, the town's wells are not exempt? Exactly. So town's wells, different story. So let's say we want to do a new service area well. We want to serve customers and put a new well right there. And we want to, we want to, we're actually able to pump out, let's say, 3,000 gallons a minute. It's a great production well. But because it's gonna impact, let's say, 200 well owners there, and you gotta keep reducing your pumpage until you don't impact wells, um, it may only be 50 gallons a minute, right? So it is gonna be very challenging to try and do, to where you're heading, um, challenging for us to have wells in those high density areas of these wells. Unless your goal is, if you sign off in this waiver, we we'll, we'll, we'll wanna serve you water, and they may agree to do that. But some may want free water in perpetuity, to say, well, I'll sign off free with the electricity. Your well, because you're gonna impact my well but I want free water for a too. That's how things usually go from those waiver standpoint. So you provide water then at some discount or even free. To get, if it's a particular few wells that are just problematic for you to get that volume of water you need. That's a reality, but that's a service provider's issue. But if you're a, a landowner and you want to put a new exempt well in, put it in and there's, they're exempt from that, that requirement. That's a great question. Shows the need for planning. Mm -hmm. Regional planning. Septics, uh, I just want to show you a map. <coughs> These are all private septic systems here. They're proliferating just as much as the exempt wells. Um, so these systems, while very um, in very low density um, development, so like you know an acre or two acres, these systems function very effectively. However, in high density areas, septic systems such as six septics per acre, which is not uncommon, they will impact the aquifer. They will pollute the aquifer uh, because the volume of that, especially in some of the shallow aquifer areas they'll create water quality issues. And Chino has already gone through this with some of the high density manufactured areas that have been annexed into the town required to go and sue those areas because they were, uh, the Department of Environmental Quality issued warnings that they were going to potentially be in violation of aquifer contamination. So keep this in mind, it's not only good to create a new water supply with the sewer, you're solving a much bigger health and safety issue. Septic systems will create problems if it continues on and on and on. Uh, Lake Havasu City, that was ahead of us on the radar screen with ADQ at the time. They were contaminating the Colorado River. Not a good thing because the federal government got involved. I can tell you they probably have some of the highest sewer bills in the state uh, because they had to do everything all at once. New infrastructure, a brand new plant, connections all in a matter of a short period of time. So again, to plan, um, plan your way to these high density areas. It solves two major issues, um, water quality and water quantity. So. Good planning on that would really help. Again, centralized treatment. You're building, you have a centralized plant. The goal is continue on with that, that strategy. And of course, within Chino Valley, there, there are a lot of uh, private utilities and another public utility. 
and through friendly negotiations, some of the water providers may not want to be in the water delivery business anymore due to all the Arizona Corporation Commission requirements, the rate cases, the cost, personnel, <laughs> infrastructure updates. So uh, through friendly acquisitions, you may be able to expand some of your service areas, um, acquire them, and then start connecting and growing your service areas. Again, through fr friendly acquisitions. Or where it makes sense, other uh, means that potentially look at serving customers through these service areas, because they're already in existence. So another, another component to think about. So based on development associated with current and future water challenges, which are not altogether different from other communities <coughs> in Arizona, there's a real need for integrated water master plan. So for your thoughts and consideration, these types of master plans typically have four master plans in them. A water resources master plan, a water system, so a water delivery system master plan, a wastewater master plan, and reclamation, and then your reclaim water master plan. So there's four master plans. They're called integrated water master plans that help you, they set a, a roadmap for successfully um, developing and building your utility to meet all the needs of your landowners and how you want to grow your town or city. These types of plans use general plans, zoning, population projections, growth centers. They look out 5, 10, and 25 years horizons and provide an understanding of current, near-term, and future projected challenges. Best approaches for overcoming uh, those challenges, identification of needed capital projects, timing, financing, the capital needs, and they have to identify equitable rate studies. Uh, what kind of rates should you charge all these customers that are coming on board? Impact fee studies um, and similar type activities. These plans are not constructed in a vacuum. Most of these instances, these plans are put together with large either commissions or stakeholder committee meetings. So you want to have all your constituents there and look at why would you do this? How will this benefit the city? How will this impact me? So a lot of these plans are done not in a vacuum, done with these with commissions or committees. These plans would also uh, lead the water conservation efficiency standards, which could be considered as part of the new development ordinances. So how efficient do you want to be? 10 homes per acre foot, 20 homes per acre foot. These plans ensure the systems meet standard utility level of service desired by customers and the level of reliability, robustness, and resiliency that you want to provide to your customers. Some may have specific needs versus others. So a new philosophy has emerged regarding this new integrated water master plan. It's called One Water, meaning that all water is equally valuable, whether you're talking black water, gray water, mm -hmm. potable water, yes. waste water, reclaimed water, it's all equal value. Even contaminated water, even salty water, brackish water, it can all be treated and it all can be used for um, the water purposes designed for it. So it's, it's now a new philosophy called, called One Water. Mm -hmm. So uh, many benefits are realized when the various, and the storm, storm water is also included there. Traditional separating the water, wastewater, storm water, and reuse are broken down. When you, when you break those walls down, a one water type of philosophy now is a guiding principle that helps you then do better master planning. Um, and advance, it's also part of advancing the science of water in all portions of the water cycle. In essence, all stakeholders participate in determining the best water decisions for the economy, the environment, and the social interactions of water occur. So it's about taking all your stakeholders, bringing them together, and make the best decisions uh, for the best use of your water, whatever that water type is. In, in essence, again, all water is equally important, regardless of its condition. We're at a stage where the crossroads were literally all water has significant value. Here's a little image showing that. You can see potable water, wastewater, storm water. And again, you're trying to get to this sweet spot here, but you have sustainable supply options, improved wastewater treatment gray water recycled, storm water applications, you're all trying to fit in that, that sweet spot of integrated water plan. This plan, this integrated water master plan, would create a roadmap for successful expanding the public utility where needed, better managing the town's water supplies and meeting Chino Valley's development challenges for the future. Uh, the plan would, uh, could also develop a financial plan a capital improvement plan that would provide for understanding and or uh, stabilizing the rates, capital needs, and future investments, and the timing for each. Again, timing is really critical. Um, these plans may provide for better and more information for further refining codes and ordinances that provide not only better water management, but better ma engagement with land development interests that match other strategic town objectives. 
Public utilities complete and update these master plans to ensure the highest level of service to the, and the lowest price to their customers, ensuring successful new and desired development and allowing water utilities and communities to control their destiny of smart and sustainable growth. While these master plans can be very expensive, um, they allow communities to turn the corner and become more uh, proactive versus reactive regarding land interest, the utility needs, and the timing for what and where things are needed. Um, so again, these well, they plans are, if you do everything all at once, it's a very expensive plan because it's four master plans. But you can phase them in. You can decide, well, I think our priority is water resources. Let's tackle that first, and let's just we'll wait on the others and we want to tackle this one. So you can phase them. A lot of communities do phase in their master plans. They start looking at doing uh, advanced planning. And with that, I, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to address any, <laughs> any questions or comments you have. There was more than forty-four. Now yeah, that our brains are fried. <laughs> He said 33. 33? Oh. <laughs> it, it seemed like more. <laughs> and a question. What am I going to do to get a super duper to be this outstanding? <laughs> 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 I'm waiting. Good question. <laughs> we call that BS. <laughs> what's what's going to happen if we don't meet safe yield in 2025? Well, unfortunately, what, what there's the um, in that safe yield um, law, um, there is no teeth. So yes. nothing will happen. No, no. Um, they may decide, well, we're going to pass a new law that has some teeth. I don't know. Um, obviously, we're continuing to increase the overdraft condition. Exempt wells are part of that. They're the third largest aggregated water user in the entire AMA. Nothing against them. It's just the facts. They're the third largest water usage. The municipalities and agriculture are the top two. Um, ag is still a big one out there as well. <coughs> right there. That's the three. Ag, municipal, and then the exempt and they're all impacts that are um, being felt. Um, the aquifer, you see the water table dropping every year. In certain areas it's more, in some areas it's less. It's a dynamic environment. The river is seeing impacts. Um, how much from overdraft is associated with that's a very complicated question because there's other factors that are affecting the river as well um, that are both very complex. Um, mm -hmm. But um, all these things are allowed by current law, to your, to your point. Um, what will happen, probably laws will change that will try to limit some of these uh, access to groundwater. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the department wants cities and towns to serve their customers because through the laws they develop, we have the obligation to require like conservation, enhanced conservation, efficiencies, uh, restrictions on groundwater. If you're all connected to the city's or the town's system, they must abide by those new laws. And we have to enforce those laws as the water provider to meet those regulations. Exempt wells are exempt just from that. So unless they, and I, I don't think anybody's going to take on an exempt well law anytime in our future, our <laughs> lifetime, because it's political suicide. Yes. <laughs> um, Arizona has one of the highest land ownership right laws for real estate. Yeah. Um, when you own land, you have um, these rights that the state wants to guarantee you have. Part of that is access. You don't own the water, but they grant you access to use the water. And it's usually without restriction if it's, if it's an exempt well. And that's a benefit of being a landowner when there's no access to a, a public utility nearby. Um, it allows for home ownership with kind of being off the grid, both with a well and a septic system. So is the state in the back of this? Are they trying to reduce agriculture? <coughs> or just trying to do they, or would they rather just see agriculture be more efficient? Right now, the program still is just to incentivize a conversion from agricultural um, water use to M&I, municipal and industrial. Well, I know it's, if you have that comment, that's a very complex question. It is, yeah. And especially when you talk to farmers, and I totally, I have nothing against farming and agriculture whatsoever, but there is some big things occurring right now. I don't know if anybody's aware of what's going on in Kingman. So California has gone through a lot of, okay, someone so um, <laughs> California farming has had some major impacts um, with the drought and all the, the water issues. So these corporate farmers are now looking for new areas with a double growing season. And so uh, Kingman has had some large farms, or large tracts of lands purchased by California corporate farming. In fact, in one year, their farming went up 25%. And wow. so now the council is very concerned about the water impacts with their limited water usage and in a limited area of good water. So that's what could happen to Big Chino. It could happen anywhere. You can even get international firms. Saudi Arabia has bought 
very big uh, land tracts down in the valley, and they're growing alfalfa and exporting that to other countries. So it's embedding water, leaving the area. So it's, that's, I have nothing against it, but you know, what are we no. growing? Are we growing all food? Are we growing like other things that are not, you know, for food? Or like, I don't want to know. Water. 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 <laughs> right. It still takes Here's water. Yes, sir. Well, I was just going on what Jamie asked you, you know, as far as the state. Um, to me, at least my opinion is, it's all about development, okay? That we don't have enough water, but let's keep developing. Yeah. And uh, my dad called that the golden rule. Mm -hmm. He who has the gold makes the rules. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's what it is. You know, it, otherwise we would just say, if you don't have enough money, you stop spending, right? If we don't have enough water, we quit developing. But that's not going to happen. So they have to figure out how to make the same amount of water go further. Yeah. And that's by restricting the homeowner on how much they use. Mm -hmm. And there you go. I think that's what the laws are created. ARS 45-555 series, which allows the importation of Regina water. The legislators were being, you know, lobbied pretty hard by managers in this region saying, there's not a lot of water here, guys, and uh, we need some, some additional water supplies from another basin. They created that statute with hesitation because they knew that was probably going to create some problems in the future. Um, look at the river nearby and, and that basin being already it was under agricultural use heavily back then. Um, that was one attempt to try and do exactly what you're doing in legislation, but is it the best solution? Uh, it's, it's one of uh, a tool in the toolbox, not the sharpest probably tool in the toolbox, but it's one of many tools. I think um, if you look at the West Phoenix Valley, they're short major, major water down there. Mm -hmm. their, their, their main water supply they can buy back right now today is conservation. So you could invest money in who you currently serve money, you serve water to. Buy that water back through, um, you know, acquiring that through conservation, increase the efficiencies. A lot of cities do that. That's another method that can, you know, you can do that. But you're right. Land ownership, the state's general plan is providing for the economy of the state, right? Which is pro growth. It's giving them access to water for the growth, and part of that access is exempt wells or other type of activity. At some point, there won't be enough water in the AMA to do a short water supply anymore. Yeah. That's inevitable. Before it's all built out, yeah. um, there's not enough water. So importing water it may make sense. I and mean, if it's not Presley and Presley Valley, there will be others that will come together and import the water. It's needed for lands that are part of those or be a part of the county, but in the AMA, that have that a need for water as part of their, their equation for their development. But it's a great point. How far away is our water in Paulden or you know, the wine glass ranch area to like one of our tanks, one of our water tanks? I think it's eight, eight or ten miles. It's not too far. It's not. It's costly. Yeah. I mean, I think back in the day that the project was priced out, just to get the water from point A to point B was about fifteen million. Yeah. It's probably a little more today. Uh, but someone else is going to pick up that tab for the town. And you got to pump it the other way too. So. That didn't include the reclaim going back out to mitigate, right? But there was a property option on that. Uh, the makers doing the work there, or finished doing the work as part of the. I went to, uh, at the League of Cities thing, they had a CAP, Central Arizona project. That was very enlightening in that they get the water for the Central Arizona project, canals that gets down to Phoenix and that, comes out of Lake Powell and Lake Mead. They are at near record lows. They're within four feet as of a month or two ago when we went to the thing. Four feet of triggering the super triple alarms of the low water, the recent rains have helped it. But uh, those things, if anybody drives by either one of those two lakes, you see how low they are by the white. Right. And so water is a major issue throughout the region. Yeah. Well, in Lake Mead, that's a great question. They're doing what they're designed to do, which is be reservoirs and have water stored, should you have a shortage. Uh, obviously, we're in a, a, this is 19, 18, 19 years of a drought, right. all right? So it's, but the, another problem with Lake Mead, and a lot of people don't know this, is that it's unfortunately deficit managed. Um, when that Lake Mead uh, reservoir was created, mm -hmm. um, they forgot to include, seriously, the evaporation every year, which is 600,000 acre feet, oh. and the obligation to Mexico. So that comes from Lake Mead. So that's you know 1.2-ish million uh, acre feet that have to leave the lake every year that are not accounted for. So the lake every year does this. It gets lower and lower and lower. Even though the same volume of water 
is coming in, it gets lower and lower. So it's deficit management, and this, the federal government has to fix that. That's a major problem. Because even when you have, you know, really great uh, water years, um, if you don't, if you have just an annual amount and an average amount of, of flow from the Colorado, it's still going to go down and hit potentially trigger a the two, 2007 shortage sharing, lower basin shortage sharing year, which CAP is the first to get impacted from that. Mm. But that's that's a big issue. But and you're right, water is, and we're in a big drought for a long time. Groundwater is drought proof. That's a good thing, um, but but it's not forever water. It's it's not renewable. Where Colorado is considered a renewable supply, it's based on snow melt from the mountains, which comes every year, year after year. With groundwater, such a little volume going into the aquifer every year, and what's being pulled out? That's problematic. That's going to only lead to big problems. You know, 60 or 100 years from now, it might, our children's children might be looking at it and say, "What the hell are they thinking?" Yeah. Um, that's, these will be big issues for our children to probably solve. But we can initiate some of these good efforts to <coughs> pave the way. But these are big issues, really big issues. When it comes down to planning, planning is really important. Yes, sir? Should, should Chino then start preparing for the exempt wells going dry as far as eventually these people are going to possibly be looking for a supplier to then start supplying our outside uh, citizens? And should we then look at what our, our quantity that we can draw from the Big Chino, should we a anticipate those as future customers for Chino? And that number will only grow. Uh, that number as, yeah. the, as the water table moves eastward away from the aquifer fringe areas and continues moving, you're gonna have more and more and more. <coughs> I don't know exactly. You could probably predict that through some good, accurate modeling, but as you see, um, Mike, how are the customers, how many new customers do you get on for the water hauling station every year? Quite a few. Okay, so that's Constantly one indication moving. right there. There's a litmus test for you that you're getting, let's say it's a dozen every year, and then for five years, and then suddenly in the next five years, it's 20, it's double that, or whatever. That's one, but to your point, that you can make that a town priority to look at on an annual basis, trying to expand your infrastructure out, but there's a problem. It's going to cost a lot of money, and your number of customers may not be a real high density, right? So you can look at this from a, this is a, a social justice that we're trying to help those that have no water on their lands, right? To trying to get the water system built to the highest density customers first, and hopefully expands from there. That, that's a, it's a planning, it always is a planning way to look at how you want to expand your utility. But to your point, it's valid. Um, those folks. You know, if you talk to them, they're like, when's the water line coming? I had that conversation with several of those folks. And um, they asked, when's the water line coming? I said, I oh, don't count on the next 20 years probably, 10 to 20 years. Because it's not going to help the town if we end up with a blighted area out there for lack of water. Or just make sure that if they're, if they're, they're very good at hauling water, I will tell you that, they, they got it down to a system. They've got their own home tanks. They, they have their portable tanks. We've got a 24, you know, seven day a week type of, uh, you know, water hauling. Maybe you need a second water hauling station. Maybe you need to make sure it's never having problems. Maybe making sure that it's meeting the needs of your customers. That might be a way to mitigate and, and help them get water when it's needed. If it's, say, the system, you only have one system right now. If it goes down for two days, that could really impact a lot of folks, right? Or so, say yeah. 10 days around Thanksgiving last year. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> Not good. Yeah. So um, that could be one way to, to, to buffer that until the infrastructure eventually will come there someday. That maybe look at the second. And that system um, paid for itself in no time. That, that's a, it's, it's you charge a little bit higher rate because you've got to operate and maintain this very you know, piece of equipment. Um, but it'll pay for itself in no time. Maybe a second or a third a water hauling station at various locations in the town. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the best way to go. Well, we lose 100% of that water, don't we? We don't get we don't get anything back from that. That's 100% loss. Correct. Right. Of water. Yeah. That's correct. Of water. Whereas if you sell it to a customer over here on a sewer, you can expect some of that back. Yeah, that's correct. 40% on average. Right. So I'm guessing most of it goes out to county people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, part. to the bigger question here, here's the big question. Can I just add real Yeah, go ahead. On the water station, just so you know, we are to the point of looking at the maximum it's on the horizon that we may run out of the number of accounts we can have for the software of the system. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll probably be looking at additional water stations and future budgets sooner rather than later. 
<coughs> so that's one of the concerns that's that Mike true. and I and customer service have already been talking about. Policy question. I think the next part of the agenda was to actually have this conversation, and then we have about 30 minutes left. Um, we uh, expect mm. your time. There's been a lot of talk about, you know, who should you sell water to? What does that look like? And whether it's reclaimed or HIA or the small amount of uh, retired irrigation grandfather rights from all matter that exists yet on the books, um, which is a very small amount. I think it's between 10 and 20 acre feet of uh, assured water supply credit. Mm. Who are those entities that you want to partner with? Um, just open for discussion. I think that's, I think, everyone, I'm, I'm sorry Jason's not here as well because I think um, that note taking on, you know, what does the town feel just from a discussion standpoint? What do those customers look like? Um, I threw some ideas for you to consider. From an industry standpoint, a customer who even uses a lot of water, you know, like the industrial subdivision, um, they may give you a lot of that water back. And it makes sense because they're a tax base, they're a job center, they give you a ton of water back, that might be a really easy one versus a uh, water industry that embeds all the water in their product and you get none of it back. Um, that might be just one way of looking at that. Do you want to be a veteran community? Um, you want to have a mix of all three? Obviously your general plan has kind of that, that zoning mix. Um, so is it as simple as let's reserve X for residential and X for commercial and X for industrial? Maybe that's the way you want to look at it. But I still throw those things out generically for you to have your conversation. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so that's, that's, I throw that out there for your conversation, for your discussion. Input, questions, suggestions? I know we've talked about the uh, sewer treatment area. And I think we're we're in a very good location in the county as far as to provide for Prescott and Prescott Valley. Um, I just know it's something we've, we've talked about several times that um, maybe instead of worrying so much about water, we'll worry about the back end of the water uh, first. You know, Jack brought something up here now. A new paper in this weekend about the whole idea. Are we? Are we concentrating too much on the industrial part and not enough on uh, infrastructure? So I think that's something we're going to sit down and take a look at. What do we really want to do and where do we want to put our money? And then look, we need, we're going to have to do the water management side some, somewhere. I think we got roads and streets right now that's going to take a lot of our time. And maybe after that issue is done, maybe it's looking at a water management plan or how we're going to do that. And what's going, to, what's going to be our thrust in the future? Are we going to continue to pull our money in the industrial park? Do we start looking at parts of town where we want to start building infrastructure? And how do we finance that? So we got a lot of work ahead. we got a lot of balls here that we need to juggle. So, uh, yeah. On the roads, I mean, if the bond stuff goes forward, it's instead of turning for a property, property tax, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, you got to tear up the roads to put water and sewer in. So, I mean, that's a good, I mean, planning project is we're tearing roads up. We yeah, might as well make it worth the money. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if the option's yeah, available, yeah. yeah. Well, that's part of the emphasis <coughs> that I think Mark and I, when we keep screaming we need plans, that's part of it. If you have those master plans in place, you know which pipes to put where yeah. uh, when you're doing say a road reconstruction and try and coordinate all that together <coughs> is, a, is a master plan situation because yeah it's it's much cheaper to do it all at once <coughs> well the public will be happy that they didn't just pay two years ago to fix a road now you're turning it up to put water and sewer in it well, we need that, customers yeah. to, if we're going to run pipe down that road who's going to pay for that pipe so we need some way to make sure we have customers in the well, area target the well, and that's what I was going to say. You still got to have the money to do yeah. it. Yeah. Well, if yeah. all the money that we're going out on the is going to go to roads, then we got to get that money for our pipes someplace else. Yeah. And I think what Mayor was just saying is we really do have three parts there. What Corey's talking about as far as our recharge, uh, and, and and the other two, you know, that you're talking about. Do we do water and sewer in our commercial areas? Do we do the industrial park? The industrial park was to bring in jobs and so on and so forth. The sewer lines, we got cus we got current customers screaming for sewer lines, you know, that are on septic right now that want sewer along the highway. Um, but I think I think the uh, the sewer treatment plant 
based on what we're talking about with our water and everything like that, the possibility of, of uh, transferring from the Big Chino and recharging back to that same area, we're in a key position. Yeah. If we can figure out how to get our part, then uh, we're ready for Prescott. Hey, Prescott, you want to bring your, you know, recharge water through us? You know, bring it on. Providing they give us their water system. Yeah, that is, I, I, I wasn't. I wasn't putting all my cards on the table. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you raised that exact point. That was that was the philosophy back then. The day was yeah, if the town is in a, a really good position because of our geographic location. It was if we build it, they will come. Right, and that's that is exactly what you're saying. But to your to your point, it's, it's critical. You know, if you are to build, if you find partners that want to finance part of that infrastructure, obviously it just takes the load off. Along the way, obviously, you're going, to, you're going to be running pipe all the way down through Chino to intersect with your current water production and treatment centers, unless you build new ones. But along that way, why not serve new customers who want to have water service, those high commercial areas, <coughs> industrial? Cash flow. That, that would be then part of this plan, which goes into what does that infrastructure improvement plan look like, an IIP that would look at here's what your impact fees would be, and those landowners that want to either, they may decide, well, we'll just do a CFD, and we'll come in ourselves, we'll fund this, we'll fund all this other additional infrastructure, or you may decide that impact fee planning is, a, is the best way to go. We anticipate X number of impact fees to be coming online every year, that'll pay the debt service. Of course, that's what most cities do, is the impact fee um, structure, and they debt fund that, or they have partnerships with development and others that go build those things. But I, the point is, the timing, you know, um, you're at a critical point where you have, you know, this much water left in your portfolio, not looking at HIA water. The day HIA water comes to Chino Valley is a whole new day for Chino Valley. Because I think that could be your designation. Um, the partner will recognize you. You'll be a provider working with landowners. you take away so much cost of small, you know, very desirable land developments that are, that are occurring in Chino Valley, like, you know, 40 acres. 30 acres, they got to spend a lot of money to get a certificate. And you can help them by making it very expeditious for them to go ahead with their projects. Um, but the timing, when does that all occur? How does that all look like? That goes back to Frank's and I we've been talking about these plans really look at your five, 10 year, and 25 year, or a, a other additional horizons you want to put, maybe even longer term. But what does that look like for Chino Valley? You know, that's, it helps build that road. Uh, and you can make adjustments. What's nice about the master plans too, if you see you're growing faster, there's there's little things you can toggle in these plans that actually say, you know, I need to do A, B, and C more because you're growing what was anticipated. If you did grow at this rate, you can do all these things. You're growing slower, slow it down. And here's how you, you kind of throttle things back. So the plans become a really good like a roadmap of, of ensuring success regardless of this independent market that exists out there on all different growth sectors. It's really it's important then to have those that information so then it's updates to the council, it's Here's where we're at, annual updates, you know, here's how things are going, here's how the plans. Um, we've implemented these things, these projects, it's gonna help all these land existing or new water or sewer customers. And that's how you really try and get that developed. Can you go back to your slide that showed the phases or the different parts of a the master plan a master plan? Yeah. <clears throat> right here. So these are four, it's an integrated water master plan is four master plans. <clears throat> wow. Your water resources, this is your water infrastructure. Your pumping, treatment, and delivery, and your transmission system. This would be also looking at HIA, pumping, treating, delivery. Reclamation, sewer, collection, the basins, all various basins, the reclamation plants, probably also look at mitigation, HIA, looking at where you take reclaimed water. And then lastly, your reclaimed water supply. That's another brand new resource and how you can grow that and how you should manage that. Can you give us a copy of that slide? Yeah. yeah. I'll, um, oh, got, I'll get it. We'll get it. The whole presentation is on the computer right there. Okay, yep. good. Yes. I like it. It'll be in the Z drive. Yeah, and Mark, the <coughs> council knows we're... all the comments, please. Uh, the council knows that we're looking at, as far as the plant itself goes, the need for the expansion of that plant. So where would that fall into the planning? Would that be reclamation and treatment? Right there. So. And that, you know, it could be decided that um, if, let's, you know, 
it's weird. Uh, it's engineering Dream is this location. Everything, as I, the basin slide I showed, everything flows to the north. Mm -hmm. Everything from the Big Chino flows southeast, and the two meet at Sullivan Lake. Imagine having a regional reclamation facility at Sullivan Lake. By my house. Right by your house. <laughs> Actually, the lot next Perfect. door to your house. <laughs> <laughs> Since you brought that up. No, um, that would be ideal because if you had reclamation from the three cities coming there, um, and you could manage reclaim water going to mitigation for HIA for all three cities, and bringing water back into the AMA and trying to get out of that overdraft condition, think what you could do. And Maybe the current reclamation plant is, is only should be built to a certain volume because maybe you need to build another plant <clears throat> to, the, to the north. I don't know that, but a plant engineers that would look at this from where you're growing, if Del Rio were to come in, I mean, what does that, what does that look like, right? I mean, that was a big, that's a very big development. Yes, it is. That's a whole other plant probably, and that could be part of that whole strategy as well. But they would all get addressed in <clears throat> those horizons, and you look at plant locations, water transmission systems, wastewater transmission, um, and, and then also uh, recharge and recovery. Because you have to recover some of that water for the certificate needs that you already have today, and in the future is mitigation or storage of those credits and recovery for part of your sugar water supply you're gonna sell to landowners. <coughs> it all gets addressed in one of these three, four master plans. You don't have to be all done at once. Most cities decide to do that, and here's the rule of thumb is, if you're growing what you expect it to grow, they do these plans every five years. If you're growing really rapidly in a community, you'll probably update these plans every two to three years. Um, but it drives, this drives your rate study, it drives your asset management capital project requirements, it lets you understand all <coughs> these systems to, number one is, what level of service do your customers need? Can you provide that with what you have? If you can't, here's how you get there. And this is how you can do all these various, and it, has, it will provide all these options for you to look at too. And that's, that's the beauty of it. You, you all these tools, it's a full toolbox. And you can then select how you want to move forward with certain things. You'll have cost estimates, you'll have uh, what it will take to move forward. And what that would solve for the challenges. And should they pop up, we, <coughs> we do that, the engineers and developers and GIs, they map it all out, they show where you're growing, a five-year five -year horizon is your most accurate snapshot. And that will show you where, what, what's going on and how you can overcome those challenges. Versus, this is just, you know, as cities convert from a little bit of rural to urbanization in certain little pockets and areas until they're fully an urbanized city, they have these growth pains. And it's more about reactionary. You have a development come in and say, here's what we want. We, you know, we want the sewer, we want this. And it's like, oh, oh my gosh, this is, you know, 20 new miles of infrastructure mm -hmm. that we didn't, just didn't see. You know, um, and those can happen regardless, but, um, knowing where they can happen and what that looks like, these plans provide that. There's no more mystery, no more reaction there. Well, we've always felt we've been a little reactionary. I mean, Molly Ray came and, you know, they wanted sewer, so we did that. But um, that may not have been where we focused our energies. And it's not necessarily just the water, but it's time, too. And we have a small staff and spent a handful of time just getting all that put up. Customer service had a whole bunch of new accounts, and um, so it's time as well. Uh, when you and I were talking, this whole thing is a little rich, right, for as far as cost. But you had mentioned that this could be broken down, like you could almost do these individually, separately to yes. kind of. Or you could even, say if you're really concerned about the water resources component, you could scope out a water resources master plan with just looking at A, B, and C and scope that out. And that's your starting place. And that's your biggest target. That's what you can afford. That's what you want to do. And we want to know what those answers look like to those specific challenges. And then as you move forward, you keep expanding on that those specific plan. And you maybe say, well, hey, we're going to, we, our, our wastewater system now is we've got all these things that want wastewater. Let's just do this is wastewater or the wastewater system. Let's just do this. Uh, and then how should we deal with it? You, you can even have right. smaller phases within each master plan. I will tell you, Chino Valley has a lot of challenges and complexity to it, especially with HIA water mitigation, those components. If you did all these at once, I'm just gonna throw a number out here just to just tell you what that probably would look like. Probably anywhere between 800,000 and 1.2 million dollars to do everything. Um, but if you did something sub less and just do like one or uh, pieces or components, it would be far less. It might be only 100 or 200,000 to do um, one of those plans, a comprehensive or half of a comprehensive plan. 
But again, it's it. This these are the growing pains. This is definitely growing pains. Um, it, it it helps you with every landowner. That's the beauty of knowing every parcel is going to be incorporated into that plan. And if it comes online, what will it take to serve them? water, wastewater, and the utility aspects of it? And then it fits into the current zoning and so forth. And of course, zoning changes, and then you make your adjustments in that, that master plan. Mm -hmm. It's all part of an updatable system. So we probably need like an uh, additional scope for all of these. And then Absolutely. maybe in January, as we're starting up a budget, really go through all the, the bang for the buck in each one of these and uh, have us another study session where we can talk about what the council might be interested in, kind of what directions they want to go and include we're, it in our budget for next year. Work well, we got the road issue. Mm -hmm. We know that the next big issue is water and because that's going to impact the budget. It's going to come in here. And we need to, we, we got to have water resources and water supply. How do we do that? This is very important. Mm -hmm. Well, the one thing that it spooks me a little bit, even if we had the money to go in and do everything at one time and get all the engineering done, do we have the ability to get it done before some of those plans become obsolete? You know, I've seen that happen before where we spend money on engineering and by the time we get to it, everything's changed. So that money's wasted. So I think we need to be cautious of moving toward it at a rate that we can also be productive. Support. Yeah. Right. Again, it'll go to looking at your current zoning, general plan, all those plans, you're absolutely right. What the beauty is, once you have it all done, the backbone is done, you may get little changes that occur here and there, but it just becomes an update. Um, they've got these models, they're hydraulic models on your wastewater system, or your water system. Little tweaks here and there become just a little tweak in a, in a, in a model that then, okay, it's now updated, here's what the new parameters are saying. Very cost effective to do an update, once you've got this backbone. And, um, I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah, if, in looking out, you know, 25 years, it's speculative, but at least you know what it looks like, right, today. Okay. Um, and yeah, absolutely, it's, it probably won't go that way, but at least you know what, what to expect. And then along the way, you'll make these updates, and you know, a better picture gets more refined. Now 25 years out is that real high precision. And you say, well, we anticipated some of these things, and we're pretty close, and, and we have a good idea what it's going to take. But it does at least give you that, that call it, you know, that first foundation laid, Everything else going forward with time just becomes more of a simplified update. It really does. Very cost effective. And those tweaks are really easy because you're going to have all digital models, very deep GIS systems that are all tweakable as the general plan is amended and those land zonings change. You make those changes in those, those programs and you update and modify those models to show what that effect is. It's fairly easy. Have you done updates in other places you've worked? Yes, I've done updates for these. Is there some sort of a fraction of the, you said maybe if it's a million dollars for everything, or so what fraction would, say, a five-year update typically be? Any idea of that? Every utility is unique. Um, I worked in probably one of the most challenging cities in the Valley, which is Whittier. Um, if you look at every challenge they had, I think even outranks the challenges you have having major Superfund sites, contamination sites. All their water was one-third seawater from sodium um, in Brackish. The largest RO facility in the state of Arizona for potable water, brine disposal. I mean, you name it, they have it. Um, so that update became, um, plus a new company was picked because the previous one had some major flaws in the plan. Uh, but um, the update was complex. It was very complex. But I will tell you this. Um, that going forward, it would be very, very cost effective because what they had done, previous master plan, they had done, you know, not the comprehensive scope. So we decided to go with more comprehensive scope. So now you have your drainage basin studies, I think to your point as well. You, you know where your gravity <coughs> fed system is going to be for your wastewater. You know how to lift water and pump water. Just, you know, those, those basins where you have to have reclamation plants, where you want to recharge water. Once you kind of know that, little details here and there may change. But it just came up with But they will be significantly uh, cost savings for future updates. I don't know if you want to add anything based on your knowledge um, at all. Anything about those types of things? Being no, a role engineer? Just, just as long as I know, um, we did the update for Mark, Coral Engineers. Um, and as I'm listening here, I mean, obviously I have an interest 
and, and helping you. And that's what we do. We've been doing it since 1933. Um, and if it's a value, I was already formulating some action items in my own mind. It's a value to um, go back and get some uh, comparisons of how other communities have dealt with this and some range of cost, that kind of thing, perhaps with Cecilia or with Frank or wherever you want. I'd be glad to, or with Mark for that matter, provide some of that information. We just finished also Prescott. Um, so you know, there are some examples that might help you understand physically uh, what Mark's talking about. As to your specific point of how much it cost, I don't remember. I did the asset management part. <laughs> Richard uh, Humphreys did the, did the master plan. If we pulled out of the group chain law firm, we have to go back. Why does the trust and trust and put that in the I don't think they've publicly stated their mitigation plan, but I, I do know they have an agreement with Summer Project to mitigate. The only way I know to mitigate, you could, you know, they do have lands that are being irrigated today, um, as are the other ranches. You could turn off those irrigation, which would be a piece of the mitigation. Oh, no, no, I meant the current situation. Yeah, Not Jack, can you repeat there. your question? I can't hear you over here. I asked why, if we would, if we drew water out of Big Chino, why today, Prescott doesn't have to recharge out here where they pull it from all the ground. Well. But not Little Chino. Okay. So to answer that question, um, Anywhere within the AMA, there's not a law that requires them to mitigate whatever well impacts because they've gone through the law at the time when they, when they drilled their well, their grandfather, grandfather. And, and then the AMA governs how you recharge and get long-term storage credits. And then they, they do have a direct delivery system that goes to the golf course for a thousand acre feet. But that doesn't get out of <laughs> It may be, you know, what, what they are recharging at the, the you know, the Sundog plant may have some molecules that eventually come to, to <laughs> our area. It might be a thousand years from now, it might be five hundred thousand. <laughs> <laughs> it gets recharged and they get long term storage credits. Um, I don't know if they're as part of their portfolio if they're recovering. I haven't looked at their portfolio in quite a while. They're they're gaining credits, but I don't know if they're recovering that water annually. They might be recovering part of that annually. I know that C V I D is part of that equation. So C V I D is taking that 1,500 acre feet, I think it's 1,500 acre feet a year, they're recovering that at their wells in CVID on behalf of Prescott's delivery to them. The aquifer is the infrastructure. That's, in, so that, you know, the recharge statute actually was, was quite well written. They understood that the aquifer does two things. It could be a conduit, just how long does it take molecule to get from here to here. And if it's five miles, it might take 10 years. If it's 100 miles, it might take 1,000 years. Hmm. But it also is a, a water, it's a water treatment facility put, you know, reclaim water in the ground. Um, it's really clean, class A plus effluent, but it can actually be treated at potable standards by the time it, in a very short period of time through the aquifer. So based on that, they created these laws that allows you to put water in the ground over here and recover it over here, knowing that um, if you follow laws and they have specific requirements, that the aquifer is your conduit to recover that water. And, and if you do recover, like for Ch Chino Chino Valley, you can recover your reclaimed water and put it in your potable system. So it's called indirect potable reuse. And you can actually legally change it from groundwater to reclaimed water molecules that you're creating and you're using. But you're putting it in your potable system. So it's almost like direct potable reuse, right? Because it's not quite the same molecules, but you can reclassify legal description of the <coughs> water. But that, that, that what's nice too is for the town, you can, if you recharge, instead of building a huge, let's say you've got this great industry that wants to come to Chino Valley. And they're, they're going to be a thousand new jobs. They're going to create two million in tax dollars going to the general fund coffer every year. And you've got to have them here. But it's 20 miles to where they want to locate, out by the temple, at the Buddhist temple. And you can't build the infrastructure. They don't want to build it. But guess what you can do? You can say, we can put recovery wells. You can drill some nice recovery wells. You're still within the AMA. And we're going to give you reclaimed water credits that you can recover in there that you can then use for your, for your industry. That's one way to actually that becomes a benefit to the town. You can do those kinds of arrangements when they make sense. So the law was written. It has detriment components to it. And it also has benefits as well. Because you may not be charged in the exact area that's providing benefit where you're pumping water. And that's our concern because it creates overlapping impacts. Comments? I'd like to take Ron's scenario one step further. That 
no, there's no reason to spend a million dollars when we don't have any money to do anything with. Uh, when does a town decide whether do we want to operate our own treatment plants uh, or is it better to farm them out? And if we're going to farm them out, can you, is there someone that can give us a financial evaluation of do we want to bring in a, a CH2M Hill to come put in a plant? Uh, how, do we, how do we get to this next step? Because again, spending a million dollars to have a piece of paper <laughs> when we, I don't see any funds. You know, we just bought a plant from Fain that they built for Fain. us. Do we want to get back in that mess again, or do we want to build our own and control our own water system? That's a good question you brought forward. Mm -hmm. So as you talked about another study session, um, and I guess one of the questions is, where Chino is located, are we fin is it financially attractive to invite a, a larger operating company that would want to come here and invest in our area, you know, end result is we end up with a treatment plant. We as a town that's on our property, we get the recharge credit from it, even though we have a different operating system and they're actually pulling operating mm -hmm. profit for their company, we still are getting benefit from it without, you know, without getting the whole pie. A little bit of a pie is better than all of nothing. So your first question, <clears throat> um, what was that? privatizing everything out, right? Were, the, were you indicating that, you, you know, do we want to be in the water utility business as a town or just have that go all privatized? That's, that's a, a really uh, challenging question because that, it depends. Um, I will tell you a lot of municipalities that I have read about, have seen who have gone into the privatization of having, they didn't want to be in the water and sewer business anymore. They just privatized out, sold their assets. We're back in that business mm -hmm. soon thereafter because when you have a for-profit company coming in and you have no control over your rates, whether you're the utility owner or not, everybody's going to come to you on rate issues. You may be all <laughs> private. You're going to hear about Appaloosa. You hear about these private utilities. You should counsel. And even if it's, you don't serve one drop of water anymore, that's town of Chino Valley. You're going to hear about everything. Every drop. <laughs> and you can control it or you can mitigate it. And I, I think that a lot of the utilities um, that were sold are in back in possession <coughs> because you operate on a not-for-profit but break-even basis. And that is a real incentive for a, a, a community where you want to just, everybody's paying for the cost to get water to them. And, and they're we're not making one more cent on that, but you, you balance it all out so you can continue to improve the system provide the best service for some private utilities, I will tell you, our duct tape and bailing wire and PVC. And, and it's not good um, because those systems have been outdated and then they get purchased and then it, you look at them and it's like they got all that to be replaced. So, or we your customers that. end up with having blackouts, right? Water blackouts and mm -hmm. that's not good. So I think from that standpoint, it's, it's a mixed bag. It's a very challenging, it depends. Um, I think if you did sell it, yeah, you could, not have to worry about a lot of these issues, someone else will worry about it, but I will tell you having other privates, like in the city of Goodyear, where I came from, 80% of the population was served by a private, and they had their plan that did not align with the city's plan on growth. Mm -hmm. So they were denying water to, to projects because it, they wanted to have the number of customers be 500 and not one big industrial com uh, complex come in. So they said, no, we want this to be residential. And we're gonna have, we wanna have 500 customers here. So they were not allowing, they were denying service to certain lands that was con in conflict with where the town wanted to go, the city wanted to go. So that, that creates big problems, um, differences of how you wanna grow areas. And so by owning a utility, again, do you wanna control your destiny? I think by being the water utility and the sewer utility and how that expands to meet your future growth needs, you control that versus another entity that has different interests. That's the only thing I would tell you about is that it could all align. It could all align and say, you're doing great. They're serving water, it's just how we want. The rates seem pretty reasonable. That can go the other way. But um, I, I have never heard about too many of those really good scenarios. They mostly have been eventually going to sell. Well, they get sold to a Canadian-based company and they want to raise rates and they want to do a whole bunch of things and expand and, and at least potential issues. 
So it can go either way. But if the utility is in your possession, you can expand it to meet your needs. Um, you control your destiny. When you do that very effectively and efficiently, you, you have a successful community. Then people do want to move there because you're sophisticated. You have looked at this, what we can plug in right here. This is where we can build. This is where we want to develop. This is where we want to grow. And this is how we would then fit into Chino Valley's growth model. And that's, if that's what you want to have occur, plan smart growth, then that's how you can control that. Um, versus, you know, a little bit of, you know, if there's more exempt wells, or it's not centralized treatment, or it's a dry lot subdivision, that, again, it creates potential future issues you have to overcome, which are water quality, or water, quanti water quantity issues that um, I think you can find solutions to, um, and probably work toward those goals. And some of them are big regional solutions. We already talked about. Okay, we're getting 11 o'clock. We're past the time. Any other comments? on the agenda. <laughs> Mark, thank you very much. That was very informative. I guess we're going to have to look at a water management plan and decide how best we're going to do that over the next few years. So I'm sure we'll be talking to Mark and talking to the So thank you for the next couple of years. We yeah, can we'll sit down and talk about water and that being the source of this particular meeting. So we can decide what, what direction we want to go in, how much money we want to go through this. Look at that on the budget for next year and see what we can start. Okay. Any questions? Nancy, you got it. Okay. Nancy, who you want to partner with, right? right? Yes. This is that policy question. Who is, that's the ultimate. Yeah. Who is your priority partner? So like, maybe that's the focus of the next meeting. Okay. Who do you want to partner with? Because I think you're going to find a lot of landowners who are going to develop, and they're going to feel there's that they own the reclaimed water of the property that, that they're going to develop. Um, and you know, already see that. Okay. So then um, you have to understand the ordinances, and then know who your priority partner is. If it makes perfect sense, they're a priority partner. Hey, we're already there. Let's go do it. But if it's not, then that becomes that's our reclaimed water. We're going to use that for other beneficial uses versus it belonging back to you. We'll find additional. Right, but that's um, truly a policy issue. It's yeah. truly this will impact on our ordinance and where we in the future. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of work too. Mm -hmm. Questions? That time it flew by. That flew by. It flew by. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's your turn. My motion will be adjourned. Second it. Second. 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 I always count on Jack. All right. Thank you very much. That's Jack's permanent job. <laughs> <laughs>